so another privilege to be in God's presence to share his word together. Hallelujah. All right, so, so we're going to discuss a topic which I titled, or I mean a message which I titled, Becoming a Person of Influence. Becoming a Person of Influence. We are in the month of November, and I thank God for your life. Becoming a person of influence. Now, we are called to be people of influence. We are called to be people of influence. To influence our world in the right direction. If you are a Christian, that is what you are called to be. A person of influence. Turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. And I want us to read from the message Bible. Every believer, every Christian is called to be a person of influence. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, message translation. Let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You are here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We are going public with this as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a lampstand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. That was Jesus speaking to his disciples and telling them in the words of, I mean, the translation of the Message Bible, that, I mean, I'm not going to, to hide you. You are here for influence. And God is not a secret to be kept. He asks a question. He says, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? <laughs> I'm just repeating it so that you can think through a bit. Because this is exactly what he thinks about you. Now, let's read the same scripture in New International Version, the New International Version of the Bible. It says, Matthew 5, 13 to 16, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So you can see clearly from the scripture that we are not here just, you know, as numbers. We're not here just to fill in the gap. We're not here, you know, just to wait until rapture comes and we disappear. We are not here just to be wagged, I mean, like tails, you know. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of the earth. 
You need to allow that sink into your spirit that I am here to influence. I am here. What does salt do? We know that salt preserves. We know that salt gives flavor. Okay, so if, if you put salt into um, a pot of soup or stew, whatever it is, it automatically influences the taste. It affects it for good. Of course, that scripture says if you lose your saltiness, in other words, if you refuse to influence, you will become useless. Now, the same thing with light. When light comes into a dark place, it, it illuminates. The Message Bible says you bring out the God color. <laughs> In other words, it shows the beauty. Someone once talked about a, a young man in the dark winking at a lady. It's a waste of time. The lady won't even see. So light is that important. Light brings illumination. It gives direction. You see, it's so, it's, it's so influential. In fact, light these days can dictate the mood in a place. There is a way they put on certain color of light in the room. And it says something. It communicates something. It affects the way people think. It affects the way people behave. So what is influence if you are to become a person of influence? I mean, influence is an English word, so I try to check the definition. It says the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. I take that again. The capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. So you are expected to have an effect on the character, the development, or behavior of someone or something. You have that capacity. You have the capacity. That's what Jesus is telling us this evening. That's what he told the disciples, that you are to influence the character, the development, the behavior of people around you, Put flavor in their lives. Become a person of influence. See, you can have a potential to be something, but not become that thing. For example, those of us in Nigeria, we say that Nigeria is a great nation. And we know that Nigeria has the potential for greatness. Everything shows. But our reality right now doesn't suggest greatness. There are persons who have met much potentials in them, but except certain things are done, certain actions are taken, certain growing up or development takes place, the potential may be there, but frustrated. Now that leads me to our next point of discussion. That's the fact that there are certain things we must do, certain qualities we must develop, or some growing up for us to actually become influence or become persons of influence. We've seen that it is God's desire. We've seen that the potential is there. But what are we to do? If you see a, 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 a young girl, you may say, this person has the potential to become a beautiful woman, an influential woman. But if she doesn't go to school, receive the proper grooming, receive the proper training, she may not become that great woman, but she has the potential. Same thing applies to young boys. So what are we to do? What are we to do? And I'll mention a few things. The, the first thing, you need to know who you are. Know who you are. Life will always ask you this question. Who are you? Who are you? And if you are not able to answer that question, life will define you. 
People will define you the way they see. First, the scripture has said that you are light and you are salt. So bear that in mind. But beyond that, who are you? In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, verse 15, there were these young guys who, I mean, just felt excited because they've heard that the apostles were casting out demons. So they, they, they follow some exorcists who were going about and just saying in the name of, of Jesus that Paul called, come out. So they too tried. But in that scripture, the Bible says, the sons, seven sons of Sceva went at a madman trying to cast out the demon out of the madman. But the demon asked them, he said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. You, who are you? And I'm telling you that from time to time, life will ask you, who are you? It will attempt to tell you that it is not people like you that should pass here. It will attempt to tell you that you cannot influence anything. It will attempt to tell you that you will remain insignificant. Some other time, it will give you certain titles and designations, just call you anything. In fact, people may define you by all kinds of labels. You will not have any serious influence if you don't start by knowing who you are so that you can define that who you are. In the book of uh, John's Gospel, chapter 1, St. John's Gospel chapter 1. Oh my God, I think I feel like reading that passage. St. John's Gospel chapter 1 verse 19 to 23. I want to read it now and we're going to read it again later. John chapter 1 verse 19 to 23. New King James Version. It says, now this is the testimony of John when the, Jew, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Verse 20, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. 21, and they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? They started to. He said, I am not. They said, are you the prophet? He answered, no. Verse 22, then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? Let me hold on there. What do you say about themselves. Let me give you a, a bit of a background. John, whom we like to call John the Baptist, or John the son of Zechariah and Hannah, you know, was the son of that priest. In other words, by the Levitical law, John should automatically become a priest and should be serving in the temple. But God has something more than serving uh, 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 in the temple for him. And he identified it. He knew who he was. At this time, he began to make impact. And because of his impact, okay, people started hearing about him. All right? So listen, when you start to have small influence affecting people, this same question will come. This question will keep coming. Who are you? So the Jewish people sent some priests and some Levites to go and ask him. Remember, I said his father was a priest. <laughs> so he was both supposed to be a priest and a Levite. But here were priests and Levites coming to ask him, who are you? Is it that they've forgotten that his father's name was Zechariah? I don't know. Maybe, or maybe not. <laughs> that, that question literally may mean they didn't know him or couldn't recognize him. 
but it may mean challenging his authority. Who, who, who sent you here? By what authority are, are you doing all these things? Why are you trying to influence the people? Go and sit down there. Who, who, do, who do you call yourself? <laughs> exactly, you heard it there. Who do you call yourself? And they started trying to define him, classify him by what they were used to. They said, are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Oh, you are Jeremiah, right? I am not Jeremiah. But you are one of the prophets. He said, no. This is also, what do you call yourself? What should we tell those that sent us? Is it that they couldn't remember? Didn't somebody, were there no... Let me not say women now before I enter trouble. I was going to say, well, there are no women gossiping around to say, um, um, do, 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 you remember that John whose mother didn't give birth in time? Now he is doing as if he's something. But John's answer to them was that, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's who I am. <laughs> He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. May God give you the revelation of who you are in the name of Jesus. May God help you to shut down every label that they've put on you in the name of Jesus. May God empower your mouth tonight to, to, to declare who you are to your world in the name of Jesus. When people come to mock you and trivialize your business, your calling, or that will have bring you to the place of influence, may God give you the wisdom to answer them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So you've got to know who you are. Who are you? In doing that, please, what is your personality? What are your strengths? What are you passionate about? What is your purpose? And what are you called to do? Just ask these questions, ask yourself these questions if you don't know your uniqueness, if you don't know who you are, if, you, if you've not identified it, do it. Ask yourself these questions because they will, they will point to you who you are. Because it is who you are that you're going to give voice to for you to become outstanding, for you to become a person of influence. Who you are will determine the values that you will subscribe to. It will determine how you behave. It is the values you subscribe to that you give voice to and then influence others around you. Second point, identify your sphere of influence or what in Christian, I mean, or in religious, or in, I mean in church terminology we call mountain of influence. Identify your sphere or mountain of influence. There's, there are these two men, great believers, in 1972, their names, Lorraine Cunningham of Youth with a Mission, and Bill Bright of Campus uh, Crusade for Christ. Each of those two guys, you know, actually had a dream in 1972, and each of them, they, 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 they knew or they felt that they needed to share that dream with one another without knowing that each person had the dream. So as they got talking and sharing the dreams, they discovered that it was the same dream God gave both of them at the same time. And what was it? God was showing them that true, that, 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 um, that there are several spheres of influence. That's, I mean, what they understood and what they thought or what God showed them. Seven spheres of influence by which they can reap a harvest for the kingdom of God. And that they can influence cultures and nations with the values of God's kingdom. Now this later developed into what is called um, the message of the seven mountain prophecies. Which um, the author Johnny Enlo and a few others wrote about. Now, these are the seven strategic places or mind molders that shapes cultures 
of every nation. In other words, in these areas, you can mold the minds of people or shape the cultures of nations through this area. Remember, becoming a person of influence and in that God has called you to be a person of influence, to influence your community, to influence your nation, to influence your sphere. And we're looking at what to do to actualize this. And we said the first thing is know who you are. So, and the second one is you identify your sphere or mountain of influence. So these seven strategic places or mind molders that shapes the cultures of nations, I just want to list them out. Those who are old enough in this star know about it because we've said them before. But these were the ones they identified. And let's look at them. Because at this time, I believe God is calling us back to, to, to show our influence or to push our influence through these areas. And the first one is religion. Religion influences us to worship God in spirit and in truth or through a spirit of religion. So it's either you will be worshiping God in, this, in, in, in spirit and in truth or through the spirit of religion. And uh, today in, in Nigeria and some other nations of the world, we know that religion is a big issue. In some parts of the world today, some people, uh, uh, um, I mean, wants to blame religion for all the wars. Oh, certainly some religions and some of the teachings, especially some of the false teachings or some of the extremist teachings create problems for people. That's exactly what we are saying. So it is either it is the influence is used or that sphere is used to influence people to worship God in spirit and truth or just push a spirit of religion which put people in bondage or send people to hate others and kill them. And so if you are called into that sphere or you need to pay attention to that sphere and use it to influence people for good, the God of the Bible, which gives us just one commandment stated in two ways, love God, and love man cannot influence you or, or, or teach you to either hate people or kill them in the name of religion. In fact, the God of the Bible is not racist. I, 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 was, I had the privilege of attending a multicultural church about two Sundays ago, and I was very excited to see uh, uh, white, black, different colors lifting their hands. And then the pastor was talking. And that day he was talking about Satan and, and some other things and said that any Christian, you know, that has anything to do with hate blacks, hate whites, or, and all those things, you are simply opening the door for Satan. Because the God of the Bible is not that kind of God. So, so you see now, that is a sphere which God has called some people to identify it and know yourself if you're in that sphere. Another sphere is family. And family empowers us with the blessing or enslaves us with the curse. So all the good and all the bad started from family. Mm. If you are looking for the place where um, rivalry, sibling rivalry first happened, and where murder was first committed in the Bible, it was in the family. Okay? But that's the same place God created it to be a place of joy, a place of fulfillment. These days we hear of wife killing husband, husband killing a, a wife, or, you know, a father using rough words to destroy. Today people have turned marriage into a necessary evil according to them. So there are persons who need to enter there because that is the smallest unit of the society. And if the family goes right, if the family is established on the values of the kingdom of God, then you're going to influence. So some people are called to influence the family. Hallelujah. If we leave that sphere, then Satan will ravage the world. 
Anything that goes against the family, anything that destroys the family is destroying the world because that's the oldest institution anyway. So some are called there to, to, to deal with such issues, to help that place. You know, I've heard of people do, talking about uh, uh, family systems engineering. That's good, excellent. So you help people, you know, make the family a glorious place. You can influence the world through there. Children are raised from the family. Next is government. <laughs> government either restrains evil or enables it to prosper. So you need to check, is this where I am called to? We've seen tyrants arise because of government. In our part of the world, one of our major challenge is political leadership and governance. Listen, I said political leadership and governance, governance in particular. So I'm not talking about election. I'm talking about governance. Of course, uh, electioneering process is, is part of setting up a government. Now, but we need to pay attention to the civil service in Nigeria. Oh, my God. Lord, help us. I don't want to say anything bad. But we need to go and redeem that place. We need to go and put our influence. If we don't put our influence there, Satan loves government. <laughs> because the government controls everything. You realize during COVID-19 how government shut down churches. Now, but let's leave that. Think about, you know, places where, that's, that's the place where policies are made so it can become the seat of Satan. No wonder the Apostle Paul said that, first of all, we should pray for those that are in authority. So what of the people that sit before those in authority? The people that draft the policies. The people that pass the files in our own situation and hide it or delay it. The ones that institute corruption there. You need to get in there. Next is education. The education, through education you communicate the truth and principles of God or the deception of the devil. And you know that these days, you know, See, Satan and his agents are not sleeping, and God is calling you to it. In some countries, they took the Bible out of the school. And not just that they did that, they used the place to confuse young people. So if you just leave your children to them, they tell them that this person has, uh, this person's daddy and mommy are two men <laughs> or two women. And guess what? Our children believes teachers sometimes more than us. And it is through the educational system that the culture of a nation is built. It is through educational system that we galvanize, make people to be on the same level, to be able to, 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 to think in the same direction. That's where the talents also are developed, at least at the early stages. So you pay attention to that. If we don't get the truth and principles of God there, the deception of the devil will stay there. There are no two ways to it. Next is media. Through media, in the media, information is interpreted. And, and I mean, information and, inv and events are interpreted through the lens of either good or evil. You see now? So... <laughs> The information can be interpreted. You, you know how the people on the media can either represent good or misrepresent it and cause, they can confuse a whole nation, can spark genocide. The Rwandan uh, genocide, we know, I mean, the, 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 the role that the media played. So pay attention to the next was arts and entertainment. So true arts and entertainment is either we celebrate virtues or we celebrate vices. So if all they show true arts and entertainment are people dancing half naked, it will soon multiply. If they show values and, and those who are out to sell the values of Satan are both strategic and they're not joking. And they slide it in between a movie. 
So get ready. If that's the place God sent you, it's time to push your influence there. That's the point we're making. And then there is business or economy where uh, resources that will be used to honor God or just used to promote man are distributed. Okay, somebody once said that money in the hand of Obama and money in the hand of Osama <laughs> will produce different results. You know that money is amoral. It's, it's neither good nor bad. It depends on whose hand it is. So if it is true business that you need to exert your influence, you need to identify. Those were the seven they listed. But in addition to that, we know that there is also science and technology. You cannot ignore technology today. Is going real far, you know. It's influencing everything. Everything is running on technology, science and technology. Drones are created, you know. We, I, I mean, we are transmitting this service because of technology. And you need to get into that space and influence it for God or else it will be used against God and against the well-being of humanity. And there's also sports, which we look at. In this time. Now, within these spheres, where do you stand? Now, those are the platforms that you can influence or deploy your influence and affect minds, affect communities. Of course, I know that you need to narrow down to, I mean, because those are broad areas which, when you get in, you need to now narrow it down. To, 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 to the very aspect that you are excellent at. The first thing I said was for you to know who you are. And I said you identify the sphere of influence in which you are praying. Next, you will need to brand yourself and identify your touch point. I'm, I'm pulling that together. Brand yourself and, and uh, identify your touch point. Simply put, a touch point is a message or a way brands reaches out to their target market, providing engagement. As it allows the brand to be seen by prospective customers. What we're saying is this. So you're going to, after identifying the sphere of influence where you operate and zeroing it down so unique things that you, so, so brand yourself, the, the brand in, it, in itself is part of bringing out your unique selling proposition. What makes you stand out? You need to do that. If not, you will be lost in the crowd and you can't seriously influence. You know, today you have some people that call themselves social media influencers. And what are some of them influencing? How to open the breast or, you know, dance naked or, you know, put uh, something in the pocket and try to tell every one of us that all ladies are looking for is a long or strong, uh, okay, because of children, I've not mentioned that, but you know what I'm talking about. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So they, 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 they sell all sorts of dirty things. Uh -huh. So you, <laughs> Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. You are the light. You have to shine that light. But for it to uniquely stand out, you got to brand yourself and, 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 and identify what your touch point is. What your touch point is. If not, you just remain there. No wonder some church musicians don't go far. Mm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Because they don't brand themselves, they don't do anything. Or some business people because they are in church. You got to do this. Hey, is that one in the Bible too? You will soon see. We'll do the example. We'll look at the example. So find out what's your touch point. What is the message you have? Who are your targets? What is your contact point? Listen, remember we've listed the spheres of influence. So it's not everybody that will stand on the pulpit in the church. As a matter of fact, if you are a Christian on a mission, you ought to know that you are sent into all the world to preach the gospel, not onto the pulpit in Desa or any other church. This is a place to prepare us to go into the world, not come here into the church. 
<laughs> the influence is not just in the church. The church can be a platform for influence or the, the gathering place because you are part of the body. I know you understand what I'm saying. So what's the message you have? Who are your targets? What's your contact point? And then how are you positioned to be seen by prospective customers? We are using the word customers generically. If you are in the education se sector, what aspect of it are you? Are you in early childhood education? What is unique about you? What are you pushing out? Oh, you say all of them are the same. No, no, no. All are not the same. I'm on the board of Role Model School. Role Model School is one of the best. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I can say that here. Oh, yes. Because I believe so. We know our children. Hallelujah. And we know the values we put out. In Role Model School right now, it doesn't do higher education. It's not a university. They start leadership academy. We know we are dealing with leaders. When you talk about leadership schools in Nigeria, you cannot but talk about DLA. We're everywhere. Exactly what I'm saying. See, so who are our targets? So, so you see, in DESA, we are always intervening in, in the areas of education because it's part of it. Remember the last time we helped some schools, we distribute, we build schools that have been destroyed. We pass knowledge. Ignorance has no place here. And we are uniquely different. So you got to brand yourself and identify what your touch points are. You know, so, so, so what's the means by which you will pass your message? Where will you stand that they will, that they will see you? I'm putting all this so that uh, to, to add position into it because you won't influence nothing if you are not seen. It is who people see they will follow. All right? So if people ask you, who are you? What will you say? If you, you've not defined it, it's part of the branding we were saying. So we see the example, I take us back to the example of John the Baptist again, so because time is running out. So we see that passage that I have read. And when you get to verse 23 of John chapter 1, New King James Version, you hear what he said. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I am what? The voice of one crying where? In the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Precision. He was precise. He knew precisely. And now, let's look at the outcome. Matthew chapter 3, from verse 1 to 5. But I will not read from verse 1. But let's get to verse, uh, verse, um, verse 5. Verse 5. All Judea and all the region around the Jordan. Matthew chapter 3. Can we put that on the screen? Matthew chapter 3. Verse 5, it says, all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him. Verse 6, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Because he identified himself, then he went straight to his location. So there is a location for you. He positioned himself. Hmm? All right? And he knew what his message was clearly by which the people will relate with him, by which they can identify him, by which they will see him. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm not Elijah. I'm not uh, Jeremiah. They were great people, but I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And look at the result. He became a strong influence. All Judea, all Jordan went after him. Glory to God. Let's move to another example, Paul. Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul. Now, if you check all the letters of Paul, at the beginning, you will see something. He said, he always identified himself, and he will either say, Paul called to be an apostle. Check it. Paul called to be an apostle. Or Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He knew precisely that he was an apostle to the Gentiles or the, the, the non-Jewish uh, uh, communities. 
uh, when he was just starting out, he was trying to do it everywhere out of his zeal, you know. But he soon differentiated himself, branded himself, positioned himself, identified, made the pronouncement. Okay, listen to this again. You see, Paul's penetration strategy was to identify key centers of influence in the cities and regions, and he spread the gospel to such places. He knew that he was out in the religious space, okay? But not just that. See how he positioned himself. He, 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 he identified key centers of influence, location, positioning. Is it on Facebook you should be? Is it on uh, uh, Instagram? Should be? Where should you be? Which city should you be? Where should you meet the people? Because this thing God gave you is not to be hidden. That's the point. So he identified them, the key centers of influence in the cities and the regions, and spread the gospel to such places. Get it, get it, get it. So these influential cities included Athens. You know, Paul was in Athens. That's the place he spoke about the unknown God. What was Athens? Athens was the intellectual center of the Greco-Roman world. So he went there, okay? <laughs> and I think that was where he rented a school and was there teaching. But anyway, that was the intellectual center. Corinth was one of the commercial centers of the empire. Hello. Paul was very strategic. The spirit was leading him to the strategic places and giving him wisdom. You see, when he got to that place and the, I mean, the first place and, and the Jewish people began to pursue him, didn't give him space, what did he do? He went to key places. Another place was Ephesus. You see that in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was often seen as the religious center of the Roman world. And Rome was the military and political center. You can't hide this thing. You will not impact the world. I say, I have anointing, I have anointing, and you are hiding. He gave you business skills, and you are hiding. He gave you the wisdom to do it well. He gave you the wisdom to an anointing to confront the demons in politics. Wake up or governance. Go straight. Oh, where are the people who, uh, the people that are in politics, where do they congregate? What do they read? What do they eat? Which market do they go to? That's what you need to find out. And brand yourself. Position yourself. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, from these key centers of influence in the various regions, the gospel spread to the adjoining villages and locations around. And what was the result? In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, you hear about him. They say, this man that have turned the world upside down has come into this place. They were that influential. They were that influential till today. <laughs> because of Paul's influence, we heard the gospel. And then he rattled the entire Gentile world, made serious impact. It wasn't by chance. He was ready to shine like the light. So in closing, you must remember that God has called you to influence your community, to influence your nation, to influence your world. And he is not about to hide you permanently. Just like Jesus said in that Matthew chapter uh, 5, you know, from verse 14 to 15, in the message translation, he says, here's another way to put it. You are here to be what? Light. You are here to shine forth. You are here to show the glory of God. You are here to enlighten people. You see, there was a place Paul spoke, look, he so teach from the school of Tyrannus that what he was teaching began to affect the economy of the nation. And when that happened, <laughs> the people, you know, began to stir up trouble. Let me tell you something. One of the reasons people stir up trouble against church sometimes if they see that they are getting economically empowered, they get scared. These people will now someday say this. So what he was teaching, because he identified the place and went straight there, was affecting the economy. 
a riot broke out. But they were steered by people who were losing money. Okay? Because where the mind of the people go is where the money of the people will go. Hallelujah. So God is telling you that he is bring, that, he, that you are here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. And God is not a secret to be kept. And we are going public with this as public as a city on a hill. He says, if I make you lie bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket. God is not willing to hide you under a bucket, okay? He says, I'm putting you on a lampstand. So, identify what spheres of influence you are called to. Narrow things down by identifying the particular location and targets. Position well and deploy your influence. Use the appropriate media or medium and push out the values of Christ through the services you render, whether in religion, government, education, media and entertainment, business, whatever it is. I will wrap up by saying that the Holy Spirit is the ultimate influencer. He actually was the one that moved John the Baptist. He moved Jesus when Jesus was standing in human form. He moved Paul and the apostles. Look, the disciples were hiding, but he moved and amplified their voices such that all Jerusalem moved. He is willing to amplify your voice and your influence. He is willing to amplify your voice and your influence. And we're going to pray tonight. We're going to pray wherever you are. I want us to pray together. Now I'm going to start with the sinner's prayer, but after that we're going to take a few prayers in quick succession because he's willing to amplify somebody's voice because God said, I didn't set you up as light to hide you. I'm about to amplify you. And somebody will suddenly pop out. Somebody's business is about to, to be in the limelight. Somebody who was hidden. Somebody's ministry. And when I say ministry, I'm not just talking about church. That thing which he sent you to do in the sphere of influence, your calling, your purpose. And we're going to pray that prayer. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit will amplify our voices. But before then, let's start with the first prayer. And that's the prayer for those who want to give their lives to Christ or those that... Um, we are believers before, but due to challenges in life, you backslid it. Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Or I want to rededicate my life to you. I want to pray with you first because you don't have any relationship with him. And your prayer may not be answered. If you don't, if you are that honest person, just place your right hand on your chest and just ask God, say, Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner. Forgive me my sins. I want to serve you from tonight. I want to live for you. Cleanse me and make me whole again. Thank you, Father. I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior from today. Amen. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord, for anyone that prayed that prayer. I ask that your hand be upon them. Transform them. Change their lives. Let the values of Christ begin to influence them. Break the power of sin. And make them new persons in Jesus' name. Now, if you pray that prayer, the link in the chat room or the button on our main platform that says decision, click it and leave us your details. We want to keep praying for you and we want to send you some materials. Hallelujah. Now I want us to all pray. I'll just reel out the prayer points and I want every one of us to pray that prayer. Can you play the song that says, Holy Spirit, move me now, make my life whole again. I want us to pray right now as we close. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
The prayer point, the Holy Spirit moved these people. He moved upon them. So the first prayer point, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to know what is written of me. Holy Spirit, open my eyes to know what is written of me. Pray that prayer. Second prayer point, open my eyes to identify my calling and my sphere of influence. When you are praying it, pray it as if you mean it. That's if you mean it. Because I'm not there with you. It's God that is hearing you. And he's the one you're talking to. Holy Spirit, open my eyes to identify my calling and my sphere of influence. Prayer point number three. Guide me to the right location. Someone needs to change his location. Guide me to the right location. Paul wanted to enter some places. Scripture says the spirit of Jesus did not allow him. It is not everywhere you will try. There are people and places he has sent you to. Even if it is school you want to start, it's not everywhere. There are specific places is, oh my God, there is someone you've been thinking, God wants to send you to a particular location where the people there are children that cannot afford but the Holy Spirit wants you to know that he wants to use you to liberate them and he's going to give you ideas as to how the resources will come. So don't be afraid. Arise and move right now. Thank you, Jesus. Ask God, Holy Spirit, Guide me to the right location. Next prayer point, help me to position myself well. Holy Spirit, help me to position myself well. What plus platform should I use? Paul went to school of Tyrannus and he, he so teach the word there. Bible says in the city of Ephesus so mightily grew the word and prevailed. The word, the teachings he was making there was affecting the economy. Oh my God. People brought their books and were born in it. Oh my God, it affected it so much that these uh, 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 crafts people had to riot because they didn't riot against God. They rioted because they were losing business. Where was the business going? It was being influenced by Paul's teaching. In other words, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If it is God that sent you, the resources will come to you. And that's where the transference of the wealth comes from. It's not in lazing about and praying in the church that money will come to me. No! Holy Spirit, help me to position myself well. It's time to invade all the places Paul knew how to go to, 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 to Athens. He knows, he knew how to stand on Mars hills and spoke so eloquently. He spoke to the political systems and the military systems. At times, he had to face different governors. Hallelujah. Somebody, God, is calling you to governance. I don't know the route he's going to give you. In fact, I'm understanding something. This is what the Spirit says. He's going to take you through professional routes, and you're going to suddenly find yourself at the top. When that time comes, remember to push the values of the kingdom, both through that professional route and the ministry they are going to appoint you to lead. Thank you, Jesus. Finally, let's pray. Holy Spirit, amplify my voice and my steps. Holy Spirit, amplify my voice and my steps. Amplify my voice and my steps. The disciples were in the upper room. When the Holy Spirit came, there was a sound. When the sound came, they began to speak. What they speak, Scripture says, all the people understood their languages. God, give me the language. Help me to speak the right language. The language that business people will understand. The language that political people will understand. God is giving somebody influence over presidents, over senators, over people in high places. Suman Talabash. Over CEOs, Macostobra, you're going to speak their language, they are going to hear you, and suddenly we shoot you on top because he wants to use you to influence them. Day Star Raising Role Models. Day Star 
Raising Role Models.